The One in Pirate's Cove Written by A Friendly Hunter 2 Narrated by Otis Gyre Chapter 1 Getting to Work Day 1 Freddy Fosbears, huh? I say, as I see the big help wanted sign, posted on the front door. It was a pizzeria that was pretty popular in this small town, and its animatronic characters were loved deeply by all the children that went there every day. In fact, I used to come here all the time when my father used to work here as an evening security guard. I would sit in Pirate's Cove and listen to the animatrons in there for hours. I learned his skit by heart. I loved it so much back then. But now, I don't know if it would have the same effect. Yeah, what the hell. The pay's terrible, but at least it's something, I say as I walk inside, hearing a bell ring as the door opens and closes softly. I could instantly hear the band singing their nostalgic songs like Freddy's Fun Times and the famous Bonnie's Birthday Bash song. Then they would begin talking to themselves and the audience casually about safety matters and to keep eating our pizza or you'll hurt Chica's feelings. An attendant comes up to me and I tell her I'm here to apply for the night shift job as the night guard. She calls the owner, who prefers being the one to get employees acquainted, and she says he'll be here soon. I thank her and decide to look around to see what's changed. Quite immediately, I could tell this was the same old restaurant that I used to love as a kid, until, well, I went excitedly into Pirate's Cove. Out of order? Oh, that sucks, I say as I look at the small stage curtain concealing the animatronic inside. These kids are missing out, I say as I look at the reservation board to see how long this has been out of order. Since 1987? That's when I was four. This has been out of order for 16 years, I say, outraged. My favorite animatron has been broken and forgotten behind that curtain for 16 years and no attempt has been made to fix it. That's ridiculous, I say. Indeed it is. I hear someone say from behind me. It was the owner. I remember you. You're Tyler, right? Your dad used to work here before he changed jobs. I nod. Yep, I'm here to accept the job of uh, night guard duty. Well, the job's yours. If I had known it was you, I wouldn't have even bothered showing up. You know how the security systems work. They haven't changed since your dad worked here whether that's for better or for worse. And I know you're very good with kids. You babysat my daughter just a few nights ago. Wow, thanks, I say, before looking toward Pirate Cove. Hey, I'm pretty good with robots and stuff, I begin. Could I maybe repair this animatron? The owner smiles. Maybe you sh... He pauses for a moment, his smile fading. Actually... Only repair the stage brats, not this one. Why, I ask. Safety precaution. He can electrocute you, he states firmly. I can do this professionally. I won't get shocked, I say. Besides, after 16 years, I, I say this guy needs to be revived, right? The owner ponders for a few moments, then shrugs and agrees. Yeah, it might do him some good. He leaves me to my own devices and leaves the pizzeria altogether. I say my goodbyes and head back into the cove, staring at the curtain. I flip a switch, and the curtain slowly opens, revealing the animatronic figure inside. His show begins to start, and I'm already ready to say the lines I've memorized by heart. Greetin', land lubbers, and welcome to the pirate... At it, it, it's called Cove, Cove, Cove. I cringe at the audio skips. His broken jaw was messing with the syncing on the audio file. I power him down and go into the backstage area to get some tools. After getting promptly freaked out by the heads inside, I quickly leave the backstage and return to the cove with the tools and some red cloth and a few of Foxy's spare limbs I found down in the basement.
and quickly got to work repairing Foxy's jaw, wanting to fix his audio skip error and hoping I could do it right. I replaced the broken bolt and his mouth hinges nicely. I tighten it a bit and make sure it's nice and snug. I raise and lower his jaw a few times to listen for squeaks. Oh, there are loads. So I add some oil until it stops. With his jaw finished, I quickly tighten up his droopy eyelid, but it was still visibly crooked. Instead of worrying about this, I settled for the fact that it was incredibly minor. I sew up all the holes in his chest and replace his claw with a brand new and shiny one. I fix his eye patch control and begin sewing up his pants, but the day was over. It was time for work. I say goodbye to everyone as they leave, and I stay behind to help the janitor clean a bit. An hour before the janitor leaves, I listen to the entire Pirate Cove skit, and I feel as happy as I did so many years ago watching it. I cleaned some of what seemed like pizza stains off of Foxy, and then said farewell to the janitor. Time for lights out. Night One I turn the power off to everywhere except the security room, sit down, and watch the cameras. I see four pre-recorded messages on the phone, and I decide to listen to one of them. The man on there talks about safety, regulations, and about how the animatronics move around. After that, it starts to escalate pretty quickly. Something about animatronic free roam and the bite of 87. Then he said something that made me understand why people didn't want this job. If the animatronics found me, they would kill me. My heart drops. Once the message ends, I check the cameras, and I see that Barney had moved off the stage and onto the dining room floor. I jump as I suddenly see him. He looked much creepier in the darkness. I look at the Pirate Cove map, and I almost scream. Foxy was staring at the camera through a small opening in the curtains at me. My alarm goes off. It was 6 a.m. I look at the cameras, and I see that everyone was back in their original spots, including Barney. This free-roaming thing was no joke. As I leave, I can hear faint rustling coming from Pirate's Cove and then silence. I began walking faster as I walk straight out the front door and greet the morning watchman. He was incredibly surprised to see me, and so was the janitor. What was I getting myself into? Day two. I honestly didn't want to come back. I thought about it for a long time. I could have just said that I wasn't interested in a job, that I wanted to do something better with my time for more pay. But I didn't. I came back. And as I walked through the door, all I could remember was how Bonnie and Foxy had actually moved by themselves. Nevertheless, I made a promise to fix Foxy, so I was going to do it. I enter the Pirate's Cove and see the curtain drawn back fully. No evidence whatsoever that Foxy was peering through it. As I open it, he's in a far corner, the same one he is always in. Some of the tools I used yesterday that I forgot were even still in the same place. I'm fixing my potential killer. Just my luck, I say as I begin trying to touch him up again. I replace his hand, but his replacement doesn't fit properly, so I had to put on one uh, without the suit around it again. His legs had no replacement, so I'd need to order them. Troubling, since they didn't make them anymore. It would be hard finding the parts to completely repair them. Having any luck, a female says from behind me, it was the greeter from the front door, presumably on a break. This guy's beat up bad, and his spare parts don't even fit him, I say softly. Oh, those are from the new model. They made him slightly smaller, she says. I can tell they aren't even close to fitting him, I say as I grunt in frustration as I get his artificial limb back into its metal socket. I throw his spare hand to the side. She watches me work for a while, fixing the hinges, mending the welds, replacing the circuitry. 
She seems impressed. What'd you learn to do that, she asks. I taught myself, I said. I loved this place so much when I was little I decided to build animatronics for a living. Even this old stuff from the 80s is pretty simple to fix. It's just bulkier. Did you come here a lot when you were little, she asks. Every day. My father worked here. I smile as I remember the memories. But it wasn't the place that kept me from coming back. It was the Pirate's Cove. I look up at Foxy. I came because I thought Foxy was the best one, and his simulated voice is great. It sounds just like a pirate. Oh, so that's why you wanted to fix him up so badly, she says, finally figuring it out. That's sweet. I blush. A yeah, grown man can still like animatronics, no matter how creepy they look when you're older. I pause for a moment. Except Foxy. He still looks really cool. Honestly, the damage makes him look cooler. <laughs> I laugh. It does, doesn't it, she says, smiling before standing up. Anyways, I need to get back on my shift. Nice talking to you. You too, I say, before trailing off and getting lost in the process of the repairs. I swear, if you kill me after all this work I've done, I'm going to be very, very mad. I turn to pick up a tool, and I hear Foxy's hand move. I quickly look up at him, and his hand is resting on my shoulder. Uh, uh, I look up at him. You aren't even on. I jump back as his neck jam snaps, causing his head to fall and look directly at me. Shit! I fall backwards. What am I even doing here? I should just... I get up and look towards the door and then back at Foxy's. I look down and grip my head. What am I doing? I say loudly. I look up and sigh and walk behind Foxy to inspect the damage. Wow, that's why it broke. It was so rusty and decayed. <laughs> I chuckle weakly. Probably just, just coincidence. <laughs> I replace the joint. I have to take off his head momentarily to get it back onto place. Yeah, I can see how getting stuffed into one of these will kill you, I say, remembering the message from last night. I wipe some of the oil from his joints on my jeans and begin putting away the tools. I sigh shakily. Time to get to work, I say as I close the curtain to Pirate's Cove. Chapter 2 Foxy Awakens Night 2 I sit in my security room, not wanting the janitor to leave, not wanting to have to turn off the power, but I had to. I wish the janitor a pleasant night, and then head to the security office. I listen to the next message on the recorder. So, you made it tonight, too. I stopped listening as I checked the cameras. Chica was gone. I go to the dining room cam and find her staring at the camera off in the distance. Oh, my God, I say as I jump. I check the other cameras to make sure nothing is wrong. Foxy was staring at me from behind the curtain again. Make sure you keep an eye on Pirate's Cove. The animatronics seem to be unique, as in he seems to only attack if you don't watch him from the cameras from time to time. Luckily, he's broken, so you can hear him coming if he does. Shit, I fixed his squeaking leg joints today. I keep the cameras on him for a few seconds, but then I quickly begin to look for where Chica went. I see that Bonnie has wandered into the backstage area, and I jump when I see him right in front of the camera, staring into it with dead black eyes. The call ends, and I lower my camera screen and look to my right and see Chica staring at me from behind the window. Oh my God, I yell as I hit the door control, closing it. Never have the words. Let's eat been more terrifying in my entire life than that singular moment. I flash the lights to see if it was still there. It was. I ignore it. I begin searching frantically for Bonnie. I couldn't find him anywhere. Where is he? Where is he? Where the hell is he? I find him in the room just a few steps away from my door. I begin to panic. I turn to Chica, still in front of the window, and yell, Leave! I can hear the heavily distorted laugh of Freddy Fosbear. I remembered that I'm supposed to check Pirate's Cove every once in a while. However, once I do, I notice one thing. Foxy was gone. 
I switch to the hallway cam and see Foxy running down the hall. Before I close the camera, however, I hear something that sounds like pained breathing. I lower my camera to see Bonnie right in my face. Chica was trying to bite me through the window, and then I hear the sound of running. I cover my eyes and hear a terrible-sounding scream of one of the animatronics, followed by the sound of metal scraping metal. My chair gets pushed and rolls roughly to the back of the room, making me hit my head on the back wall. I slowly look up, rubbing the back of my head, and see Bonnie lying on the floor with its entire face torn off, trying to get up with Foxy standing over him. Foxy looks at me. Foxy, I say, scared out of my wits. No, 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 no. I try to back away from him as far as possible. He takes a few steps towards me. Please, no, don't kill me. I'll do whatever you want, anything. It extends its hook out to me, and I press even further against the wall. I cover my ears as I hear an incredibly strange laugh from the kitchen camera. I begin to have a panic attack. Foxy looks at the cameras, back to me, and quickly grabs my hand and drags me out of the security room. No, please, no, please, you can't do that. I begin yelling, but Foxy puts his hooks to my throat to silence me. Tears form in my eyes as he drags me all the way into Pirate's Cove and closes the curtain behind him. I fall on the ground roughly and quickly get onto my knees. I'm going to die here, I think. They're going to find me stuffed in a suit, and then they'll try to cover it up like nothing even happened. I jumped onto the ground and covered my eyes, waiting for death. It never came. I slowly, very slowly, look up, scared of seeing its eyes, its face. The animatronic I loved was now the animatronic I feared most. It was across from me, its face obscured by the shadow cast by the curtain. But its eyes, they were glowing white and yellow. I try to speak to tell him why, but I can't form any words. I was scared stiff. Only 2 a.m., and I had to spend another four being stuck with an animatronic in a dark room where I could barely even see. My only light was the soft light being created by the multitude of glowing dark stars hanging everywhere. They were even printed on the curtain using some sort of reflected material. Yar, matey, welcome to the Pirate's Cove, he says slowly. I cover my eyes. It takes a step closer to me. Welcome to my Pirate's Crew, landlubbers. He was repeating his skit to me slowly. I was mouthing it silently. I see plenty of bright and excited faces today. Ready for exploring, he says, taking another step. I look up at him. Who's going to be my trusty first mate today, laddies? Don't be shy now. He is right in front of me his claw shining in the low light. He stops his recording there. He extends his claw towards me, and I cower away from it. He looks at his claw, and then extends out his hand instead. Come on, laddies, don't be shy of old Foxy, he says. He only said that if no one said the words that triggered the next part of his skit or grabbed his hand... What do you want from me? I finally blurted out. He just looks at his hand, then back to me. Then he says something I've never heard him say before. You remember me, right, matey? I gasped. You're the little tyke that was always a boppin' and a hoppin' in here first thing every morning, with the smile on your face and the sparkle in your eye whenever you saw this old hunk of junk, right? Yes, I am, I say, tears in my eyes. I I am, was that little boy. Aye, t'was what I thought. He put his hand over my shoulder, just like this morning. Never forgot old Foxy, did ye? Never gave up on me, aye? No, I never did. 
I wiped my eyes. I never did, I repeat. Foxy picks me up off the floor gently. I'm too scared to fight back. You're the only person in this world that hasn't ever given up on me. You're even fixing me up. He laughs for a few seconds. I haven't laughed in ages. My troublesome jaw prevented me. You're grateful? You won't kill me? I say slowly. Kill ye? He looks toward the curtain and back. Why would I go and do that, matey? How could I kill my favorite little crewmate? He embraces me slowly. I couldn't kill ye. Not when you're the only person that still believes in me. He holds the hug for a few seconds before letting go and backing off a few steps. Thank ye for everything you're doing for me. I smile and... Yawn. You okay, matey, he says to me, I nod. Yeah, I'm just tired. I yawn again. Throughout the rest of the night, I stayed inside Pirate's Cove. Foxy claimed the others were waiting right outside the room to make their move, so if I wanted to stay in here, it would have to be an all-nighter. Tis been long, it has. How old are ye now, he asks me. Twenty, I say. You grew up so fast. You could really be my first mate now. You understand the effort it takes to maintain me, I? He asks. Yes, I understand completely. Sorry about taking your head off earlier, I say apologetically. Foxy chuckles. <laughs> Twas nothing. You did it for me. I talked to Foxy about how he got so beaten up but he refused to talk about it no matter what I said to him. He also avoided the very important question, have you killed anyone? Also, now that he could move freely, I was able to get some parts inside the exoskeleton with relative ease, so he allowed me to do some more repairs on him. Apparently, it was ticklish to him. Do you think you're ready to perform for the kids again? I ask him. He looks at me for a few moments before saying, What if they make fun of poor old Foxy like they used to? I frown. You gotta take it and just ignore it. You won't be able to please everyone. Just like how Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy can't please everyone with their songs. They don't? Foxy asks, puzzled. I thought everyone loved those traitors, he says angrily. No, I, I know a lot of people that outright hate them. Me included. I smiled at him. I only like it here because of you. I extend my arms, asking for a hug. He hugs me back weakly, probably afraid that he would hurt me. Then he says, Matey, tis six o'clock. He lets go of me and gets back to his previous position. Go get some sleep, lad. I'll be here when ye come back. I rub my eyes and look towards the door. I'm too tired to go home and sleep. I'm going to sleep here, I say, softly. Foxy smiles. Go ahead and do that then, matey. I lay down in one of the cushioned chairs, and I am out like a light. Nightmares fill my sleep. But Foxy saves me from those, too. Chapter 3 The Bite Day 3 Hey, kid, wake up, I hear someone say as I'm ripped from my current dream and into the real world. I awaken with a jump. I look and see it was the owner of the establishment. I get up quickly and look at him. Oh, uh, hey, boss, uh, I say weakly. Why are you sleeping in here, and what the hell happened to Bonnie, he says. My heart sinks. That's right. Foxy tore Bonnie's face off. I have to think fast. Oh, uh, he got damaged while in free roam mode. He looks at me skeptically. In the security room? Where you were supposed to be? He says. No matter what I say, he doesn't seem to believe me. As he leaves, he tells me he's very surprised that I survived Bonnie entering the room I was in. He knows they're killing people and he doesn't care, I think. 
So, what are you going to do, the greeter says as we sit down in the dining room. Her name is Jessica. She sips her coffee. I take a small sip of my tea. Oh, no, I say. The owner says that they could fix Bonnie, but they weren't because they're replacing him once this place shuts down and reopens next month. So they just put a replacement head on and are leaving him off during the day. Is that true? she asks. Is what true? I say. Is it true Foxy saved you? I heard from the people managing the kitchen. They saw Bonnie's damage, and it looks like a claw did it. Foxy's claw. I sigh and then smile. Yeah, it's true. I look towards Pirate's Cove. He saved me. We even talked a bit. He remembers me. Her eyes open wide. You kidding me? They're just robots. Are you telling me he actually talked to you? Yes, I am, and I can show you. Come on, I say as we pick up our drinks and head for Pirate's Cove. Are you sure about this? She asks. He's not supposed to be on during the day. She grabs my shoulder as I reach for the curtain. He's already on. He's just sleeping, I say. I can wake him up, I say. Just be careful. You know about the book, she begins, but I interrupt her. I know what I'm doing. Foxy wouldn't hurt anyone, I say as I open the curtain, revealing Foxy within. Foxy, you paying attention, I say as I step up on the stage. Light through the curtain activates you. Come on, man. Be careful, Tyler, Jessica says warily. He could... He could listen to me and wake up, I say as I shake him a bit. Work up, buddy. It's okay. You can turn on now. She's a friend. He does nothing. Foxy, we have to talk about things. I need you to wake up for me. He remains still. He's not going to turn on, Tyler, she says, grabbing my arm. Let's just come back later. He's faking it, I say as I get out of her grasp and take out a screwdriver. I'll show you. I open up his back panel and beginning making repairs again. I remember what you said this feels like, Foxy. Foxy begins to vibrate. What are you? Jessica begins, but then backs away as Foxy's eyes open. Stop it, matey, that tickles, Foxy says as he turns around to face me and jumps backwards off the stage. He falls on his knees as one of his leg springs snaps. Foxy, I say as I run over and get him back on his feet. I'll get the tin in a jiffy, don't worry. Thank you, matey, he pauses and notices Jessica. Who is your little lass here, he says as he looks out at Jessica. She smiles and looks at him in slight fear. What's the matter, little lady? Oh, Foxy, don't scare you, do I? She nods. Me friends may have a bad reputation as of late, but I wouldn't harm ye, he says as he extends his hand out for a handshake. She looks at me and back to Foxy. Unsure of what to do, I beckon her to shake his hand, and after a long pause, she slowly grabs his hand weakly, and he shakes it. Nice to meet ye, lassie, he says. I haven't ever seen you before. Then again, I haven't been fully on in sixteen years, either. Jessica smiles, which makes Foxy smile as well. Then his legs falls off, and he falls. Oh, sorry, Foxy, I say in surprise. Get me up, matey. I've fallen and I can't get up. So you talk and can understand us, Jessica says. I... For how long has this been, she asks. Oh, since about I was first put into to cove and turned on, Foxy says. He twitches a bit and tries to look behind himself. How are the repairs doing, matey? He asks me. Why does every part of you have to be rusting and broken? I say in frustration. I'll take that as a good, Foxy says, chuckling. Hey, Foxy, I ask as I screw in a new bolt. I've been wondering something. What would that be, matey? Foxy asks. Well, last night you called the other animatronics traitors. What did they do to you? I ask. 
Foxy freezes up for a second, then looks back at me. Well, you see, about 16 years ago, "'Twas an incident concerning a little girl. He stops for a few seconds, his eyes calibrating. I bit her. Well, it was just a bite, nothing too serious, right? Tyler, he bit the little girl's frontal lobe off. Aye, I did. But it wasn't completely me, though, either, Foxy says. The others had been getting away with a few murders already, I just stayed in the cove and minded me own business. But that day, while I was roaming around the dining room, he talked to me. Who's he? I ask. The one who created us, the golden one, Foxy says. He told me to head towards the bathrooms. Chicka and Brownie followed me inside. Two little girls were waiting for their mother to get out of the bathrooms. I wanted to get out of their way to let me pass, but Bonnie and Chicka blocked my path while the Golden One was using some sort of device to make me his slave. I listened intently, wondering who this Golden One was. The little girl tried to get by me, but... Me actions were not me own. I blocked her path, and she started making fun of me. And the golden one was talking to me inside me head, telling me some awful things. And it was making me angry. I was confused. I was scared at what he could do to me. And that's what he wanted me to get. Angry. He pauses for a few moments looking at Jessica and then to me. I bite the girl. Her friend, her sister, begins clawing at me legs, trying to get me to let go of her. Crying, the mother runs out and hits me with her heavy purse, breaking me jaw and causing me to let go of the girl, to my relief. But the damage was done. The girl wasn't dead, but she would never be the same. I could tell. He twitches slightly and continues. Later that night, after they killed the newest security guard, they come to me, little cove, and notice me legs. They were torn. I wasn't in me full costume. That's not allowed. So they break me. And they laugh and smile and have a grand old time doing it. Foxy closes his eyes. And once I'm nice and shattered... Freddy comes up to me and says, You'll never be loved again, before turning me off and stuffing the body into me. Jessica gasps. They must have removed the body very shortly after. It would have been easily visible through the tears in your fur, I say. Aye, they did, and that was the only time I ever had a body inside me. The others, they love it, but I don't. I don't like it at all, Foxy says, sighing. Jessica comes up to him, and he looks up at her. There's a long pause before she comes up and hugs him, saying, I forgive you. What? Foxy says. I forgive you for what you did to my sister, she says slowly. Foxy leans back a bit, then hugs her tighter a visible look of sadness in his face. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry for what I did to you and your sister. I smile. Forgiveness was always a good thing. Night three. Fuck it. If someone really wants to break in here, they can get eaten for all I care, I say as I go into Pirate's Cove. Foxy, wake up. It's time to go. Foxy awakens from his slumber, looking at me. What do you mean, matey? You are coming with me into the security office, so I have some company tonight, I say. Now hurry, before Chicka shows up. Foxy hops off the stage and comes with me to the door. As we step outside, we are ambushed by Chicka, Freddy, and a heavily twitching and broken Bonnie. They were blocking the way to the security room. 
run, I yell as we head for the exit of the restaurant. The janitor leaves the door open for me. Just run through it, I yell. I don't think I can, matey. I'm confined to the restaurant. Foxy yells as his legs lock up as he left his designated area. He falls straight onto the ground. I drag him. I won't leave you. They won't kill you. I yell as I'm able to get him through the door. I quickly slam the door and lock it before they can get through. However, Chicka's leg had locked up as well. Only Freddy was at the door, watching me with a content expression like he had usually. Creepy freak. I always hated your music. I yell at him through the glass. I look back at Foxy and see him struggling to get up. I rush over to him and unlock his legs again. He gets up and looks around. So, this is what it's like on the outside, eh? He looks off into the distance. Not quite as glorified as I originally thought, but it'll do. I laugh. It's pretty run down in this part of town. He didn't know that, but he would probably figure it out if I showed him around. But due to the fact that he was a robot with a history of biting a girl's brain out, I decided we should stay near the pizzeria. Want to go sit in the park and talk, I say. It's right around the corner. Park? He asks. What's a park? It's a place where there's lots of trees and plants, I say. Huh. Sure, why not, he says. Tis so much more different outside, Foxy says as he dragonfly lands on his nose. Tis a sight to see all of these beautiful things. I'm glad you like it, I say. You see this stuff every day, Foxy asks. More or less, I say. Foxy walks around the park, visiting and talking to the ducks at the pond, and watching the birds fly overhead. It was very much a different world to him. Unfortunately, he would probably never see it again, which pained me to have to say to him. As I say it, his ears go completely limp, falling down behind him, making the look of a sad animal. Hey, if something happens, we can always come out here. But I have to stay inside or else the animatronics could escape. Or at least Freddy could escape. I have to be the bait. Foxy looks at me worryingly. I hope you don't think like that all the time. I'm fine, Foxy. I'm okay with it. I don't want them to kill anyone I care about, or anyone for that matter. I hug them. It will be fine. I look at my watch. Let's get back to the restaurant. It's almost morning. I begin walking, but Foxy stays where he is. I turn to him, folding my arms. He speaks up. Will you promise me that I'll see this place again, he says. I smile. I promise, bud. You'll see this place again. I grab his claw, and I begin leading him back to the restaurant. Chapter 4. Violence is Golden Day 4. Time, 7.55 a.m. Ah! I yell as I wake up from another nightmare. I check the clock and sigh. Ah, It's only been another ten minutes since I last went to sleep. I huff in defeat and throw my head back onto the pillow. The nightmares are getting worse, and it didn't help my already destroyed sleep schedule at all. If the animatronics weren't going to kill me, my lack of sleep was. I sink back into sleep again, and as I rest my tired eyes, I am instantly face to face with a bloodied Freddy Fosbear staring at me through the front door of the pizzeria. I wake up again and find that it's 8.03 now. Knowing sleeping wasn't going to help, I very reluctantly get up. I stumble round my room, finding my employee clothes and lazily throwing them on. I was hating myself for just throwing them everywhere when I got home this morning. I shamble into the kitchen and get a bagel out of the pantry. I grab my house phone and call up Jessica, chewing on the bagel as I dialed her number. She picks up almost immediately. Hello? Tyler? she asks. Yeah, yeah, it's me, I say groggily. You okay? she asks, worryingly. Just no sleep at all. Too many nightmares. I also think I'm starting to see things, I say as I sit down in the living room. 
Well, the hour is a murder, no pun intended, she says. I hear the sound of keys opening a door. She had just unlocked the doors to the pizzeria. Well, the hours aren't the only thing that are a murder, I say. That's why I feel silly for her. Ah! She screams at the top of her lungs, and then all I hear is the phone hit the ground and then turn off. I jump at her scream, and then when the phone cuts out, I just stare at the phone. Then I move. I quickly run out my front door and get on my bike. I had to get to the pizzeria. And fast. Time, 8.24 a.m. I run through the doors of the pizzeria and find Jessica's cell phone. The screen was cracked, and it wasn't turning on. It looked like it had been stepped on by a very heavy foot. I look around the dining room and see a clear sign of struggle. Chairs were thrown about. The neatly aligned birthday hats on the tables were either crushed or on the floor, and a blood trail was leading into the back room. No! I say as I run for the back room. Jessica! I yell. But before I get to the back room, the blood trail turns and heads for Pirate's Cove. Chica was standing in the doorway. She was in free roaming mode. Chica notices me, and her head focuses onto me at inhuman speed. Her head twitches, making her jaw that was unhinged shake around freely. Then she charges at me. Whoa! I shout as I quickly duck and roll under the nearby table and get up on the other side. Chica lifts her arm into the air and smashes it right through the table, and turning it into splinters while leaving a reasonably sized dent in her arm. Let's eat plenty of pip pip people, kids, Chica says as she tries to bite me. I pick up a piece of wood and shove it into her mouth. She crunches down on it and breaks it into two with hardly any struggle at all, but it gave me enough time to get away. No running, k k kids she yells as she continues chasing after me. I run down the hall and into the security office, quickly closing the doors. She appears on the right side window, trying to damage it in any way she could to get through and kill me. I frantically looked around and found the emergency trap door that leads to the basement and into the back room. I quickly grab my flashlight and go in. She had no idea where I would end up, I hoped. Do you hear that, lassie? Foxy says as she passes her a torn shirt to use as a bandage. It sounds like me first mate Tyler is here for ye, and Chica ain't having none of it. He stands up and heads for the door to help him, but Jessica calls out for him, her voice trailing off a bit at the end. Foxy, I still need you, she says as she wraps her spare t-shirt around her leg. Damn, this stinks, she shouts, grimacing at the pain. Foxy moves to support her into a chair, carefully lifting her and placing her down. Chica got a good bite out of your leg, I he worriedly says as he looks at her leg. She looks at him. No, it's not too bad, it just stings. I think she broke one of my toes after I got knocked down and tried to push her away. Then I got cut by her teeth. Foxy applies pressure as Jessica wraps the leg. He was careful to be incredibly gentle. He didn't want to hurt her on accident. How was your sister? He asks quietly. What was she like? Jessica pauses and looks up at him, letting out a deep breath. <sighs> she, she was my best friend, she says slowly. I was always with my sister. She was the oldest, and I looked up to her so much. After the bite, well, she just wasn't the same person. She pauses, and tears swell up in her eyes, but she wipes them away. After the bite, she just ceased to really be. She was still there and everything, but she never remembered anyone or thought of anything, and never talked in more than just gibberish. It was as if everything that made my sister my sister was just gone. Foxy is silent as Jessica wraps her leg with the torn material he gave her. Once she finishes, he sits down next to her, glad that nothing inside of him was breaking anymore thanks to Tyler's continued maintenance. Foxy looks up at the dangling glow-in-the-dark stars that hung everywhere in his little cove 
He always wanted something a little more pirate-like. And then he remembers Chica. He gets up quickly and heads for the door. When he's about to open it, he looks back at Jessica and says, I got to go help Tyler. Will you be all right? Yeah, I'll be okay in here. Just please make sure to close the door, she says as she rubs her leg. Foxy nods and heads outside to confront Chica, making sure to close the door as he left. I feel around in the darkness around me, listening for any sounds, to only hear nothing. I take out my flashlight and turn it on, illuminating my path ahead. The only things I can see are cobwebs, pipes, and a few bits of trash leading into the looming complete darkness. As I continue down the tunnel, I begin to smell blood and the lingering scent of burned flesh. I find a few scattered rats around, dead, and had been fed on. Some of their bodies were resting on scalding hot pipes, bodies black and charred. The smell was almost enough to vomit, but it's better than getting killed and stuffed into a suit. Eventually, I break through to a rather large room. After removing cobwebs from my path, I find that inside the room was a golden Freddy Fosbear suit. It had a steady trickle of rat blood escaping from its mouth, and it looked like the endoskeleton inside of it had completely collapsed in on itself. The sight made me jump. Why is an animatronic down here? I had never seen this suit, ever. Its design was completely identical to the original Freddy suit, except that the color scheme was gold instead of brown. The suit also looked much older than all the others by quite a few years. The endoskeleton was bulky and gave me a World War II era vibe. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria opened shortly after the United States ended the war and was a place where many returning veterans took their children to once they got back home. I took a few cautious steps toward the suit, wondering if it was still active. As I get closer, I feel a sharp pain in my head. It hurt to the point where I actually was forced to back away from it. As I back away, I trip, and the next thing I know, I'm lying in a pit of children's dead bodies. What the f- Oh my God! I shout as I get up, quickly scrambling to my feet. As I turned to look back at the pit, it was gone. I was hallucinating. I turned to look back at the suit, suddenly remembering something. Foxy told me about you. I remember you now. You're controlling these animatronics. You're the one making them want to kill. I yell at the broken suit. It stirs slightly, letting out an unsettling human-like moan. It attempts to get to its feet, but very easily collapses before it gets very far at all. That's why you control them, isn't it? Because you're so broken, you can't do things yourself. I say as it slowly raises its head to look up at me, causing blood to pour out of its eyes. Then I see something completely unexpected inside of the suit. There was a body inside of the suit. A chill runs down my spine, and my breakfast comes up in the aftershock. I look at the suit one last time and run. I hear the familiar shriek of the animatronics followed by a human shriek, and I can hear the suit successfully get up and begin walking towards me. The sound of bones breaking and blood falling is all I can hear. Luckily, I make it to the back room trapdoor before it catches me. Hopefully, it couldn't follow. Foxy looks around at the damage that was caused by Chica's and Tyler's fight and commends Tyler silently for being able to handle himself. He sees Chica come around the corner and she looks at him, eyes of pure black. Let old Foxy release ye from ye torment, I Foxy says as he flashes his hook. I think tis the time for one of the poor children's souls to have a rest. Foxy's eyes fade to black as well, and he lowers his eye patch as he gets ready to fight. Nothing you can do can stop us, pirate. You're a killer just like the rest of us. Accept who you are and join us, she yells. I may have had the instinct within me once, but not anymore. 
I'm nothing like ye and the rest of your murderous band, and I never will be. Foxy raises his hook. Now get ready to walk the plank. He yells as he dashes forward, slashing with his hook. Chica sidesteps it and punches him right in the stomach, throwing him back. You're too slow, cripple, she says smugly. Foxy angrily gets up. I'll send ye to Davy Jones' locker, he yells as he charges her again. I've had enough of ye, enough of all your friends, enough of this ear damned hellhole we're stuck in, he says as he swings his hook around violently. I've had enough of being alone. He screeches out as his hook claws into her shoulder, ripping out the circuitry, making her left arm go limp. You're always making a fool of yourself, Foxy yells as he begins prying her arm off. And the kids love ye, but when they see old Foxy, all they see is what you did to me. He rips her arm off. F -f Foxy, stop, Chica yells as she raises her right arm and hits him square in the left side of his jaw. Foxy can feel his face collapse slightly, his left eye breaks. I broke you once. And I'll break you again, Chica yells as she reaches for his throat, beginning to crush the circuitry inside. And this time, you'll stay broken, Chica yells as she tightens her grip. Foxy makes a gasping noise, feeling the lack of power to his head. He sticks his hook into a vulnerable spot in her right arm and twists. Her hand lets go and springs upward. Foxy falls forward, landing on his knees, his neck barely able to support the weight of his head and his broken jaw. "'What did you do to me?' Chica yells as she has to struggle to get her arm back into place. Foxy looks up at her, holding his head in place. "'Oh, just a little trick me first mate taught me while he was repairing me.' He lifts his hook to strike her down, and then thoughts filled his mind. "'She deserves more than just a quick death. Make her suffer.' Let her see what it's like to be broken and thrown away forever. Foxy pauses. Get out of me head. You won't control me again. However, the thought had been planted, and in Foxy's rage, he hacks and slashes at Chica, tearing wires and fur to minuscule pieces uncontrollably as he tries to fight off the influence of the Golden One. With one slash of his hook, her head falls off, and the hydraulic fluid and oil that was inside sprays out and coats him. I'm not forgotten, Foxy yells. I'm not trash. I am somebody. He falls to his knees again. People will love me again. People will care. I will be loved again, he says quietly, repeating himself. He begins to get angry. And nothing will stop me. Nothing. Foxy hears a footstep in the corner of the room and quickly turns to see it. His head nearly falls off, but he catches it. It was Tyler. T -t Tyler, you're okay, Foxy says, relieved but sounding angry, his black eyes shining. What be the matter, Foxy says as he notices the fear in his face. He looks around himself and sees the various scattered pieces of Chica strewn about some of her wires even stuck in his broken jaw. He had bit some parts off of her. You, you look, I begin. You, I can't finish. He has stopped believing in you, the voice in his head begins again. Teach him what happens when people stop believing in you. No, me first mate would never stop believing in Foxy. He yells as he gets up and runs up to and grabs me. Ye wouldn't doubt me, would ye? He says as he raises his eye patch and looks me directly in the eye. Foxy, you're acting weird, I yell, trying to escape his grasp. Let go of me. Of course I believe in you. Just calm down, I yell as I finally break free of his grasp. I then run up and hug him, and he hugs me back. He holds me tight, and I could feel that he was relieved. I grab his head and look him in the eye. I would never, ever give up on you. We are friends, and I never leave a friend behind. Foxy's eyes change back to their usual orange, and somewhat of a smile forms on his slightly dislocated jaw. I could imagine that, if he could, 
he would be crying right now. I like the touchy reunion, but I have a job to do, a familiar voice says. Both of us turn toward the entrance of the establishment, and we both see the owner. Master, Foxy says. Yes, Foxy, I'm here, he says dully. And it seems you have dismantled your sister, and that just won't do. He walks to the door leading to the back room and opens it, and the golden Freddy suit struggles out of it. You're up too, eh? He says calmly. The suit ignores him. Wait, what the hell? Tyler says. You? And the words faded away in the back of his throat. Yes, I created them. Brought them to life. True life. He says as he wipes off the golden suit's shoulder of dust. Five souls entered these suits on my command, and five souls gave them the life they needed. But why? <laughs> why? He laughs. Isn't it obvious? To kill people! He walks towards the stage. And with Golden Freddy here as the ringleader, I'm never involved and I can kill as I please. The owner raises his hand, and Bonnie and Freddy wake up as well. Bonnie has been prepared. Speaking of souls, I need more. I was hoping to get one from good old Mike Schmidt, but he was too smart for my poor killers in training. I had to fire him. He looks directly at me. But you seem like the perfect candidate. And as he says that, a hook stabs me from behind through my stomach. I look behind myself and see another foxy, brand new and with a completely different design, and then the room goes dim and fall limp. Foxy is restrained by Freddy and Bonnie. He tries to claw at his replacement, but it's no use. He cannot reach. Tyler, Tyler, speak to me. Speak to old Foxy. You can't be dead. You made me a promise. You promised I'd see outside again, Tyler. But his plea fell on deaf ears. Tyler was dead. New Foxy digs his hook out and drags him towards the owner. The owner then walks up to Foxy and turns him off. All you had to do was stay in Pirate's Cove, he says. All well. He turns to his animatronics. Let's go. Leave the cripple here. We have a body. They follow him out of the establishment and into a moving truck, leaving Foxy to gather dust. Jessica, finally finding the strength to stand, leaves Pirate's Cove and sees the aftermath of the fight. She turns on Foxy.